Mm -hmm. uh, it's my pleasure to tonight, as the southerners would say, to uh, welcome you to tonight's uh, Language Teachers Forum. Now, seriously, with all the lenses, don't know where to look anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Hanno Kotze from the Institute of Continuing and Teaching Education. Did I get it right? Correct. At the University of Queensland, commonly referred to as my neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah did uh, a uh, presentation for us recently at the Institute of Modern Languages to the point that I thought this is great and it needs to be shared with more people. Uh, Hannah here is actually a senior lecturer in EdTech at the University of Queensland. He has done extensive work in places outside Australia, such as South Africa and Cambodia. And that's great, isn't it? Vietnam, Vietnam, but close enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the their neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> Was that photo you just showed before Cambodia? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, no, I got confused because of that. Oh, okay. Anyway, he's been abroad. <laughs> <laughs> and he's uh, here today to uh, talk to us a little bit about how we keep conversation going. When we mean conversation going, as we all know what actually happens in the classroom, and we tell the students once upon a time, you do your homework for next time, and I'll see you next time around. But there are various ways nowadays of actually keeping the classroom interaction alive beyond the classroom. We've uh, entertained that idea a little bit in the past and we uh, would like to discuss it in more detail and Hanno is here tonight to tell us far more about it than I can. So without any further ado, Hanno, it's all yours. Thank you. Well, thanks for, uh, for the very nice uh, introduction, Marcel. Um, yeah, th and thank you everyone else who's joining us here in person and virtually. Um, yeah, uh, as, you, as you said, um, I, I work at the English uh, Language Institute at the University of Queensland and um, one of the big things that, uh, that we always uh, grapple with is how to keep that learning going outside the classroom because we get our students in every day, we get them there for uh, a couple of hours, uh, four hours, two hours depending on how long our sessions are and then they leave and we don't generally know what they're doing outside to use the language and, and how they're using it and whether they're using it at all. So um, that's something which I've always uh, kept in the back of my mind and sort of as a, as a um, problem question to deal with. So hopefully um, today my aims as you can see, well I'll get to my aims in a second but um, I'd like to share with you a couple of different tools that you would be able to use um, quite easily with your own students um, to sort of keep that conversation going beyond the classroom, get them using that target language beyond the classroom. So I'm quickly going to show you um, the logos from five different tools and um, I'll give you guys a few, few seconds, maybe if you can just turn to your partner next to you and say, do you, see if you know the, the names of any of these tools. Do you recognize any of them? And those of you at, at home, maybe you can uh, share in the chat. Which one? Which one is that? Uh, yeah, it's close. It's a similar. It's a similar. It's a similar tool. Hi, Brent uh, from Toowoomba. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So those of you right here, you recognise that one, of course. The we are the just so familiar, aren't we? <laughs> so um, that one up there on the on the right of the screen is a blogger which you may know, blogging tool, um, which you can use very well um, you know, to get your students um, producing written language outside of the classroom. Goose Chase is one that I'll be sharing today. The one in the middle is Padlet. OneNote was close, but it's their competitor, not Microsoft, but Google, Google Docs. And the final one up there is Flipgrid. So I won't be talking about all, all of these today. I'll be focusing on three of these, Goose Chase, Padlet, and Flipgrid. And hopefully we can uh, try some of them out in action. And I'll show you some examples of how I've used them um, to quite good success in my own class. Um, the reason I put the other two up there is because I have used them as well for collaboration and for engagement outside of the class. Because Google Docs 
has that collaborative function so students can work on documents in, in real time at the same time um, from home, from a coffee shop, from wherever they are. So it's really good for uh, that kind of uh, student collaboration. So um, that's the aims today. I'm going to introduce a few of these tools and apps and I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how I've used them uh, in the classroom and beyond the classroom. And we'll try one or two in action. And finally, hopefully, there's a bit of time for some question and answer afterwards, which there usually is when it comes to technology, because um, there's always a bit of a learning curve. And some people are further along on that journey of um, educational technology than others. And um, I think one thing that I really like about these tools is it does cater to all different um, ed tech proficiencies. Um, it's not just for expert users. You can get involved from the beginning and you can um, you know, scaffold that, that learning and that proficiency as it comes along. And you can uh, add new and more creative ideas at different levels as you move through your own um, confidence with the tools. So, as I mentioned before, that was the sort of question that, I, that uh, keeps me awake at night. Um, in a professional sense. There's other questions as well, but this is the, uh, the, the one that comes up um, sometimes from work, is how can I get my students to engage in the target language beyond the classroom? And how can I make sure that that's actually happening? How can I check that? And if possible, can I even provide feedback on that? So that's something that, um, that I, I've always been interested in, and also along with my interest in educational technology, they sort of intersect, and um, I think there's a lot of tools out there that allow for this to happen, which is fantastic. Um, it's one of those benefits of technology. Um, you know, technology has obviously uh, lots of drawbacks as well, especially if we're teaching children and um, well, even for adults. But there are definitely some of those benefits that we can harness and use to our advantage, and this is definitely one of them. So. Let's begin with the first tool. And I'm not going to ask you to use this, but I'll show you some examples from my own classroom of how I've used this. And Flipgrid is a social learning platform. Um, it's basically, uh, the way it works is that you, the educator, you leave a task for your students on the platform. It can be a video task, or it can be a written task, and you ask them to perform that task via video. Um, short videos usually between 15 seconds and uh, three minutes maximum and what's really nice about it one it's free which is fantastic you can set it up in a very safe closed environment it's used a lot in K to 12 and uh, different schools in Australia but also in the US um, because it's got that closed secure functionality and um, it allows for great feedback as well you can either give feedback via video or you can give feedback via a little criteria uh, rubric that you can um, modify yourself. So let me show you what Flipgrid looks like in action. And I'll just come up here and I'll show you. So this is my, they call it grids. So grids are your different sort of classes or topics that you have. Um, and what I'd like to show you guys first is maybe um, one example from, I'm just going to come back here from one of my advanced English communication skills classes. And um, you can see here, I've posted nine different topics. And on those nine different topics, there's 114 videos, which makes for, it's actually much more than that. I think it went, it clocked over at 100 hours, and it came back to five hours. So it's actually 105 hours of engagement beyond the classroom. And I'll show you um, an example of some of the, the, the ways that I've used it with this class. So they're advanced English communication class. They have quite a high level of English. Um, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with this, uh, the CEFR framework, but it's a sort of C1 level. It's quite advanced. So um, they focus a lot on spoken fluency and also um, spoke, uh, yeah, spoken and listening skills, that speaking and listening skills. Um, so for example, near the beginning of the class, when they all they were new to Australia, um, I made a few videos with some of my colleagues and I asked my colleagues what are some things that you found hard adapting to Australia because one of the nice things where I work is a lot of the teachers come from different countries 
uh, the students are always amazed when they realize they don't even have an Aussie teacher. They've got a <laughs> teacher from South Africa or from Germany or from Scotland and so on. So I thought I'd use that and I'd uh, you know, interview some of these teachers. So this is me interviewing one of my co-teachers, Tanya. Hi, Tanya. Yeah. Hi, hello. So um, where were you born? I was born in Germany. Oh, great. And when did you move to Australia? Well, I moved to Australia when I was seven. Ah, oh, still yes. quite young. Yes. All right. And um, thinking back, what was um, one of the main differences that you noted um, between Australia and Germany? Well, um, we, when we first moved to Australia, we lived on the top of a mountain and there were no houses be behind us. So I was just fascinated by the, the wildlife, like the, the rainbow lorikeets and the, the owls and the lizards and the... Okay, I'm not going to show the whole video, but she talks about, you know, the differences and then she also spoke about the difficulties about adapting. She came here, she didn't speak any, any English and she was just put into school and she had a real hard time. She'd, um, yeah, it was quite, it's actually quite a moving story, but I, um, I filmed a couple of my co-teachers doing that, including myself, I gave my story as well. And I used this in class, the students would watch it and they'd make some notes um, about the different difficulties and comparisons. And then I asked them, right now it's your turn, you've been here for a week, what are some of the things you've noticed? Some of you have been here for longer. And I asked them to record the videos on this. So, um, so for example, hmm, let's see, which one shall I show you here? Um, I'll show you this one. Uh, I, uh, I was born in Japan and I came to Australia in March, so I have stayed in Brisbane for about six months. And the uh, main difference I noticed when I first arrived is the uh, price of food and drink. In Australia, it's more expensive than in, that of Japan. I, before coming to Australia, I didn't know the, the thing. So also in Australia, I don't have a part-time job, so it's hard for me to buy food or drink. Okay. And so she goes on uh, and she talks about that. But what's also nice is then the other students can respond to that video. Hi, Oi. I heard you found the public transportation here is the most difficult for you to adapt to. Um, Actually, I have the same problem, and um, the only solution I can think is we should plan before we go. So I usually use the website Translink to plan my trip. Okay, so they so they sympathize and they give advice. Yeah, practical help. And it's also sort of, um, you know, rapport building because they get to know each other a little bit more. And I then would also leave them some comments and give them some feedback and maybe record my own response to that problem. And I might even, if it's, a, you know, if it's something we can address, we address it in class. You know, I show that I pull up the TransLink website or something like that. So um, it's got a lot of practical application, but it's, you know, and you can see she's sitting in her bedroom doing this. She's doing this outside of class. And that's what I wanted. I wanted that engagement with the classmates and in the target language beyond the classroom. And it's also evidence for me to show that they are doing this. Um, so that's one example there. Um, another example that I can show you with a lower level class. Um, <laughs> so here is wh this is where you put your questions, your prompt in there. So they know exactly what they're answering. Um, so another Flipgrid example would be from a, let me just go back one more, from a level four, which is a lower intermediate class. And um, we were studying the, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the second conditional grammar point. It's this hypothetical future. If you were the president or the prime minister, what would you do? And we practiced it in class. We, uh, you know, studied the, the 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 form and the function. We did a few practice activities in class, and I thought, how could I extend this beyond the classroom? And I realized that a lot of my students um, were in homestay, and um, I said, all right, why didn't you go interview an Aussie? Go and 
uh, ask your homestead family, or if you're not in homestead, go and ask someone on the street. Um, in a, and we spoke about safe strangers and how you can approach someone on the street and, and so on, and, um, and what if they don't want to be recorded. And we spoke about all those things, and, and, and they went out and they um, went and answered this question, or they asked this question, and these were some of the responses. Uh, if you are Prime Minister of Australia, what is one thing you would change about the country? So you notice that there's no video, so this person didn't want to be videoed, which is fine. You've still got the audio and you've still got the language to work with. If I were the Prime Minister of Australia, I would lobby for more funding for mental health programs, especially focusing on policy to support anti-bullying programs in schools and the workplace. Um, why do you think so? To reduce the number of suicides as a result of ongoing bullying. Okay, thank you. Okay, so again, quite a, a serious topic there, but um, you know, it's something then you can bring that back into the classroom and you can discuss that. What is bullying and how does it happen and so on? Because um, for a lot of these students, it's a sort of, it's a cultural thing they're not really familiar with. Um, here's another one interviewing a homestay sister. If you were Prime Minister of Australia, what is one thing you would change about the country and why? I would make Australian playgrounds more safe so if children fall off equipment, they won't injure themselves. Also so hospitals will have more time and room for other patients with more serious matters. Okay, so what I actually did with, with these responses was I brought them all back into the classroom, we watched them all and the students had to have a debate about which ones they thought were the most important ones to, um, to uh, you know, enact as a law and uh, they used the language that I wanted them to use and they, uh, they were really engaged because it was an authentic task and, um, and that's something I'll come back again to later, the importance of authenticity in a lot of this and how that gets students motivated. But um, yeah, that worked really well and it's that repeated practice that gets that automaticity of the language going. So not just practicing once or twice but doing that a couple of times in class, taking it outside of the classroom and then bringing it back into the classroom. So they've got opportunities to use that language several times so that they can really get it into their long-term memory. And that's really worked really well. Um, I'll just show you one more example from another class of Flipgrid. Um, so this is my current class that I have. It's a Pathways English class which what that means is they, um, they study with us for 10 weeks and then they do a little test and then they go into their university programs. So we've got master's students or um, they've all got conditional offers from the university. So it's quite a high stakes course, it's quite academic um, and so on. So I, had, um, I set them up with ex extensive listening projects. I get them to listen to a podcast every week and then I get them to answer, um, summarize the podcast in video and ask each other a question. I put them in groups and then they have to listen to their uh, other group members questions and answer those questions so it sort of goes in a circle um, and everyone has to answer everyone's questions so it's really good because it's it keeps them accountable because they don't want to let their team members down by not watching or listening to the podcast and not asking the question and they also then um, they have to ask a question at the end so it keeps everyone accountable and they keep going around like that and that's a really good way too to get them sort of um, on task and practicing that language. But the one I wanted to show you was um, this one about definitions. So we practiced how to write good definitions in English in class and then I gave each of them a different word and I said don't say the word, um, just write a definition for it and make a little video without saying the word and see if your classmates can guess what that word is in the language. So I'll just show you one. Hello everyone. This word is a woman whose job is take care of the passengers on the airplane. I'm sure you can guess what that is, although it's not just women who do that job, but um, and then they have to cabin crew. Yeah, that one's not very um, talkative, just cabin crew. <laughs> 
the student is great. He calls himself awesome. <laughs> That's his nickname he gives himself. Very confident. Hello, I got your worries. Air hostess. So they give different answers. So it forces them to listen and try to guess what that meaning is. And then um, in class, then the next day, the student would, they'd all share their words and everyone would see if they were correct with their guesses um, for the different words. So there's a lot of different applications. Yeah. Um, it depends, basically, you're limited by your own creativity with this. And students don't have to record their faces if they don't want. You can also see they can put little emojis over their faces. And um, what's nice is you can also give feedback. Um, so let me just, cl I'll just close this. I'm struggling here with getting, there we go. So I can build in my own feedback Hello, here. I can add different um, criteria. I can make it pronunciation or vocabulary or grammar and I can give them a score or I can just write them a comment and it goes straight to their email privately. So I've written some feedback for the student here and I've given them a little score on their grammar and vocabulary. So it's really nice for that feedback. Or sometimes I do um, video feedback and I say, oh that was great. I think your word is blah blah blah. Make sure you focus on your relative pronouns when you blah blah blah, something like that. Okay. So there's different ways of giving feedback because for me feedback is one of those really important elements of this project as well, giving feedback. Alright, so that's Flipgrid. Um, and as you can see here in this class, I've had this class now for eight weeks. We've got, um, I'll just come back to the main page, we've got 94 videos, 2,000 views and almost 60 hours of engagement and that's engagement outside the classroom. Them responding to each other, posting the videos and also me responding to some of the videos. So that's really what I wanted and that's, that's the power of sort of tools like this is you can get that conversation, keep that conversation going outside the classroom. Was there any questions about Flipgrid before I continue? Or should we keep them for the end? I'm not sure. Yes, security, um, mm -hmm. you said that um, it's very close and yes. increasing. Yeah. Um, is that information easy to find? <coughs> How you make it secure? No, the the policies and um, the terms and conditions is it easy to find? That yes, it is. Um, as I mentioned, it's it's set up for schools actually, K to twelve system. So. Um, yeah, so um, there's lots of different ways you can get the students onto it. You can sign up with email addresses or you can use a school domain or uh, you can give a code and a password and all of that. Um, and there's information about the, the um, privacy. It's all quite um, freely available. Mm -hmm. I, I use it at my school mm -hmm. um, and I Flipgrid has on its site an example letter that you could send home to parents explaining. Um, I reworded it, it's a little bit of a hard sell. Mm -hmm. um, their document, you know, it's oh, Flipgrid's fantastic, mm -hmm. um, which it is, but you know, that's not <laughs> how I would normally word on it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, and you know, and I did get permission from the parents for their children to use it, um, but uh, and then I didn't. Yeah, so I did set it up with the, um, I set them up with a code, so then no, it's not done through their email addresses, oh, which means okay. then that I don't have that opportunity for feedback mm -hmm. um, in that way, but I, I just figured that that mm -hmm. was just the choice that but I made. But you can still the, do the video feedback. Yes, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, you know, and that's fine, mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's, there's different options depending on your context of how you set it up. But for me, the most important thing is it's free and it's going to stay free. You know how sometimes these tools, they start out free and then you really get into them and then uh, suddenly you've got to pay. They've, um, they've promised they're going to stay free. It's been taken over by Microsoft. Yes. So Microsoft it's bought now them. got a big backer and it's mm. all good. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the next one, which is Goose Chase. Has anyone heard of that before? No? Okay. So Goose Chase is an online scavenger hunt platform. Um, it's free for participants, but as the, um, the host, you can get a free account, but it has limited features. Um, I found that the, the free account, when you sign up for the education free account, it's good enough if you have one class. Um, if you are doing a sort of, uh, you know, a 
year-wide several courses at the same time type thing, you might want to invest in, or you might want to ask your, your principal or your DOS to invest in, um, I think it's $150 for an education premium package a year, which is not that much, but then you get more features. Um, but I, we do have that now, but I spent a good year just using my free account and I had no problems with it. So basically what it is, is um, it's an online scavenger hunt and you build in different missions, they call them, which are sort of submissions, like you would have on a paper scavenger hunt. And the way that you submit evidence is either through photos, text, video, um, or GPS check-in as well. And um, it uses gamification, so there's a leaderboard, there's points. Um, there's teams if you want and things like that. So it, it really taps into that student uh, motivation of wanting to, to win, but it's friendly competition. It's not really serious. And um, you know, it really uses fun and active learning because students have to get around and go around and have a look and work in teams to solve problems. And um, if you set it up correctly and you build your missions correctly, you can really work on their language while you're at it. You can get them to, to really practice their listening and their, and their pronunciation and also their, um, their reading skills as well. So I thought the best way to, um, to demonstrate goose chase was to do a goose chase. So I've asked all of you to download the app already um, and I apologize to those of you who are joining us virtually. Um, because we'll be doing something in the room at the moment. But if you've all got your instructions in front of you and you've downloaded the app and you click Players Guest, and as you can see on the screen, me as Mission Control, I see all of your answers coming through in real time as an activity feed on the screen. So I can see everything that's happening over there. Okay, all right. No, Guys, no time is up. And I stopped the game. And there we go. And you should get a message on your phone saying the game has stopped or something like that. Now, something that I didn't show you was I can actually, so there's a leaderboard there. And I can also send messages while you're going. I can say, keep going. Um, Crystal is in the lead. <laughs> and then I can, um, whoops, oh, that's the team. No, send it to all participants and I can say, um, well done, or something like that. Okay, so you can send encouragement and you can, um, and there it comes through on your phone. So it pushes that notification to let you know or say, well, there's one minute left or something like that. Okay, and what's, still well done. Okay, so there you go. So <laughs> if we were to use this, the mm -hmm. students would need that app on their yes. phone. Yes. From the game. Yes. Yeah. 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 Or they can do it in pairs. Yeah. Um, pairs are nice. Things like that. Yeah. 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 Or you have one phone per group. You have them in a group and then you can do some really nice teamwork. This was an individual one, but what works really nice with team ones is if you say something like, you have to get a, um, you know, a selfie in... <laughs> under the table with all of you in the picture mm. or you have to make the letter M with your bodies mm. and everyone has mm. to be in it. Mm. You know, it's really good for team building mm. um, and also instruction following and if you have a nice campus or something like that you can always go around beforehand find some interesting places on campus for them to check in or mm. to answer a question about and so on and you don't have to go anywhere because you can stay there and you can see the activity feed and you can also, um, what's nice with the submissions is you can afterwards, you can watch them and then you can give some bonus points. So here are the PD Pro ones. And that's okay. So I can say, oh, I really like that selfie. I'm going to give you 150 extra points for your for your beautiful smile. <laughs> there we go. And then you'll see that those points come up and they're automatically added to the leaderboard. Okay. But Crystal is still the winner overall. Oh, I'm using your phone. Inside info. Okay. Uh, so you have a leaderboard. Is it only for like, doctor? 
do you have? No. So you, as the mission controls the teacher, you have to do it on a PC or a laptop. Yeah, yeah okay. it doesn't work on a phone. Mm. The app is only, you could do it through your phone on, um, on your browser, but it doesn't work through the app. Okay. Yeah. In fact, as the, as the host, as the mission control, you don't even need the app. Um, you can just use the website. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So I've actually used this to great effect um, over short periods of time for campus orientation or for um, you know, orientation around class, but also for student engagement. And I've actually done it over a long period of time too. So again, I've got this going with my class now for seven weeks and they're still completing a lot of the missions and I keep adding more. So over Easter, I thought, oh, it'd be nice to add some Easter themed activities. So I said, you know, um, take a selfie of you eating a chocolate Easter egg in one bite, those types mm -hmm. of things. Find the Easter bunny. Um, so you can make them very, um, you know, uh, event specific and the students really like that if you add something around a, a cultural event or um, around I something like that. For, for me as a Japanese teacher mm -hmm. I could um, have a one of the challenges could be to um, you know say konnichiwa mm -hmm. at a sushi train or so you know like yeah yeah absolutely out with your family absolutely to speak in Japanese at a if you go to a Japanese restaurant or something. So something else that I've done, this is my class that I currently have, the, the pathway students I told you about, the academic ones. I've added ones that are, um, I'll just go down a little bit, that are course book specific too. So, um, so for example, textbook task, unit four, which is about business. Visit the Vinnie's op shop in the city, browse and maybe even buy something cheap to support it. So they've got to go check in at Vinnie's. So um, one of the tasks they had to talk about was um, uh, presenting about a different charity. So I make it specific to what they're doing in class as well. Um, so that they can see that the, the things we do in class, the textbook things, it's related to the real world. Uh, we don't just, it's not just fabricated um, tasks. Sometimes it can be, but we can make it more authentic. And again, I'm coming back to that idea of authenticity because it's so important. If you can show students how what they're doing in the class is related to themselves and to the real world outside the classroom, it really motivates them to, to engage and to use the language. So yeah, so that's Goose Chase, um, one of my favorite tools that, uh, that I use. And you can use it in a variety of contexts. It's really, it's really useful. And what I generally also do, thinking about data security and so on, is I tell the students that once the game is finished, I delete all the data. Because you can actually do that. You can delete the game and delete all the data. So none of their photos or anything is stored on the internet or anything like that. So once the game's finished, it's finished. Well, the photos are stored on your phone, aren't they? On my phone, not on... No, on mine. Okay. No, once the game's deleted, it'll disappear. Okay, so ones that are sitting now in my folder here would disappear. Only the ones that you've taken. I know, okay. Yeah. So but you not can't delete it, only you can delete it online. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's up to the, the teacher to delete the game once it's mm -hmm. finished. Okay. So coming to our last tool, which is Padlet. Um, have any of you used Padlet? Marcel, you've used it, I know Lee, you've used it. Yep. So Padlet is basically an online notice board, but it's actually much, much more than that. Um, it started out as an online notice board where you could post, um, you know, text um, posts, they call it, on your Padlet, and then the, the students could add as well. But these days, the functionality is um, they've added to it, and there's a lot you can do. You can add um, video, you can add uh, doodles like um, drawings, you can add audio, you can add links, you can use it as a file storage. Um, there's so much you can do with Padlet and um, again students don't need an account to use it. Um, you who makes the Padlet, the teacher generally, the educator, you do need an account and Unfortunately, Padlet's recently gone to one of those freemium versions where you can get a couple of free Padlets, but after that you have to pay. So a lot of teachers have come up with the ingenious way of getting around that by recycling their Padlets. So once they're finished with the class, they reuse it for another class. They delete all the content and they just use it again. Um, 
So it has all the same features as the paid version. The only problem is you don't have an unlimited number that you can make. So you won't be able to sort of store them um, for posterity, I guess, if you were so inclined. So I've got a couple of examples that I'll show you guys from some Padlets from my class. And then we'll finish by maybe thinking how we can use some of these tools in our own context by posting on a Padlet. So the first one I'd like to show you, I'll come back to my advanced English communications class, my X class. And you can see it opens up in your web browser. Um, and this Padlet is called my awesome X Padlet for session eight, which was the end of last year. And there's different ways that you can make uh, your Padlet wall. This one is called a shelf because I put something up at the top like a question and then students post underneath that um, with their phones. So for example, on the first day I had them um, interview each other and ask them, what did you learn about your classmates today? So Urara wrote here, she met Hannah from Korea, she wrote a little story and then I can comment at the bottom. So they all posted there what they learned about their new classmates, so a nice little get to know you activity. I also set up another Padlet which is actually in this one um, for where they can chat with each other. So it's a sort of closed group chat that they can use. I won't show you that. I think um, that's for another day. I put up links to things we talk about in class so they can just come up and click on the links over there. Um, this class also had a project. They had to, <coughs> their project was they had to do digital storytelling. and. They had to do everything in the project. They had to do everything from coming up with the ideas, doing the recording, but also advertising their projects to the rest of the school because it culminated in them doing their digital stories in front of the whole school. And to do that, they had to make posters for their advertising. So I had them make posters and then I thought, oh, you've got so many posters, I can't use them all. Let's vote for the best three. So I had them put all their posters up here and you can see there's little lights at the bottom. And I said, choose your three favorite posters. You can't choose your own. So they put all their posters up, and then we voted for the three. And those are the ones that I then put up around the school. And they were very proud, the three that got their, ch their, their posters chosen. Um, that one got six votes. That one got nine votes. That was one of the winners. OK. So something else they did. Um, delicious things we've eaten. <laughs> So some of them put up some of their favorite restaurants. For some reason, they always like to go to the chocolate place, the Sanchuro place. Um, if there's events on campus or events in Brisbane, I'll put up some links there so they can, so they can see what's going on. Um, I'll just hide this one so I can move around easily. If I have my board work at the end of the class, I take a photo and I put it up there for them to review. So very simple, I just, you know, excuse my board work. It's not actually very neat. But um, yeah, so I just take a photo of the board and then it's easy for them to review the language as well. Every week I'd put them in different teams and I would, similar to Goose Chase, I'd say, here's your challenge. So week two we were talking about the self. That was the unit in the book. So I said, post a picture or a video of something that defines you um, or an aspect of your personality. So they would post it under their, uh, what did they put here? Oh, this was the week one, one about my childhood. So they had to talk about their childhood and so on. Something that reminded them of their childhood. Um, so every week there'd be a different challenge. I had them write little poems, recipes about me. So they'd make a little recipe about their personality and so on. And then what I did with this class too is I took them to Goma for a visit. And I actually made a separate, and I'll click on that to show you, I made a separate Padlet for their GOMA visit. So what I did before the time was I, um, I found some, some paintings in GOMA, I took uh, photos of them and I um, printed it. And I cut it up into pieces and I gave each person in the class a different piece. And I said, go and make your painting, like a puzzle. Mm -hmm. So they went and put their, their painting together and that was their GOMA group. And then I said to them, now when we're at GOMA, go and find your painting. Your first task is find your painting and take a selfie with it. So these were the paintings and then the, that's the group taking their selfie with their painting. And they really enjoyed that because they go running around first looking for their painting. That's mm -hmm. them under their painting. These guys there. 
and these guys decided to put on some pumpkin. It was around Halloween, so they put on some pumpkin um, filters there under their painting. And then I gave them a few different tasks, and I said the other one was find an image in Goma that represents Australia to you. Take a photo of it, put it up, and say why it represents Australia. And I put their names, all the students' names along the top, so they knew where they could post their, their, their photo. Um, so this one chose this one, and they do a little thing about what, you know, what the painting is, what materials were used, why they like it, and then we can comment on it underneath as well. So that was the, the other task I gave them. And then I gave them a third task, which was find a self-portrait in Goma, or um, the other one is Quag Goma, so the Queensland Art Gallery, Quag. And um, I said, tell me what you think that person was thinking when they painted that self-portrait. So they found, you know, they'd find one, and then they'd do their little story, and I can give feedback. And I like this because my co-teacher that I teach with, she said, hey, that guy looks just like my husband. And she put a photo of her husband <laughs> over there. <laughs> and he does actually. So anyway, and it was really nice because we can you know, see what they're doing and how they're engaging with the paintings. And, and it's a nice bit of evidence to show that they're actually not just um, using it as a, a, a day out to relax and do nothing, but they're really engaging with, with the art and using the language that we practiced in class and so on. So um, that's one of my favorite activities that I did with, with Padlet. And then, just the last one. Do I have time to show you guys the last one? Is that okay? Oops, did I just jump out of here by accident? Was, which one did I want to show you? Uh -huh. I wanted to show you this one. So again, coming back to my current class that I have now, the um, Pathway students. So this is our class one. Get them to do a lot of figurative language, and they post their, their sentences, and I can do some error correction and video links just like the other class, lots of online tools. But one thing I had them do, we were talking about um, business and fast fashion, this idea of disposable fashion and cheap fashion. And I said, all right, let's go out onto campus. Let's go talk to some people, interview them about their fashion choices. So they went out and um, they went in their groups. And what's nice about Padlet is you can see this button here. You click plus. And what you can do there is you can upload a file, you can add a link, you can Google something, you can add a photo, but if you click that button, you can do all of those different things. So you can um, add, for some reason you can't do it on this browser on Edge, but you can do it on Google Chrome. You can add, or on the app, uh, screen, voice, film, map, you can draw, you can do all these different things to, to, to put on the Padlet. So they went out and they did little, um, audio recordings, Vox Pops, and just see, this one's getting a bit stuck now for some reason. Let's see if I can play any of these. It's mouse is getting a bit. Have you heard of the term planned obsolescence? No, I haven't. And uh, how often do you replace or upgrade your software? Like uh, apps? Um, Oh, so these guys, they each had a different one. They had to go talk about planned obsolescence. The other one was fast fashion and so on. So they'd go and interview Australians. And um, I then, what I did with that was I listened to all of them and I made a couple, um, I think I put it here, yeah. I made a little worksheet that we would then take back into class and we'd listen to what the people said, but a very simple gap fill, but authentic listening. So not from a textbook that's nice and clear and um, beautifully pronounced and so on, but you know, dirty, quick listening, really hard, Aussies, um, <laughs> different accents and so on. And they really enjoyed this activity because they a vested interest in this. They collected the samples themselves. And um, I, I then made the, the activity. So they really enjoyed it and they engaged with it. They really tried to understand what everyone was saying. And um, it was one of the best listening activities I've, I'd actually done with them because you know, we'd listen again and we'd slow it down and we'd really uh, decode the, the, the listening. And they really enjoyed that. So yeah, again, same as the other tools, lots of different ways you can use it. Um, the only limit is your creativity, basically, when it comes to, to these tools. So just to end, I guess, I'd just like to finish with that little question there, which is, 
why are these tools so powerful? And for me, I went and did a little bit of research and I um, stumbled upon again, I revisited Decky and Ryan's self-determination theory, which is sort of a, it's more like a meta theory because it's a, it's a sort of seminal work that underpins a lot of motivational theories in education and, and learning. And what they found through all of their, their research, their meta-analyses and so on, was that if you as the teacher can support these three conditions, uh, the individual's experience of autonomy, competence and relatedness. They found that those three, if you can support those conditions, you really get the most out of your students. You get the highest quality motivation, which is, then leads to high engagement and high performance. And in a language classroom, high performance is increased language proficiency. So if you think about these tools, what are we doing in terms of autonomy? We're giving the students autonomy to go and achieve these in different ways. We're tapping into their competencies, not just as language learners, but as mobile phone users, as technologically savvy individuals, and also their um, love of video games and gamification. So if you think specifically about goose chase, that, those gaming elements. And finally, also relatedness. We're relating what's happening in the classroom with the outside world and also with themselves. We're creating authentic tasks with um, authentic materials. And that's why students tend to react in such a positive way um, when you use these, is my hypothesis. OK. So we'll end there. Um, and what I'm going to ask you to do, and I think everyone at home can do this as well, you can visit that Padlet site, you can scan the QR code, it's on the back of your paper there. And what I'd like you to do, or you, if you don't have a QR code scanner, you, um, you can just type in that link, padlet.com, with my name there, LTF. And I'd like you to go and think and add an idea there of how you could use one of these tools in your own teaching context. So there's the Padlet. <coughs> and you can see the first column there is is the question, how could you use these tech tools in your own context? Thanks for the order. Let me know if you have trouble getting in. I can come and help you. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, there's actually a feature called Grid Pels. Have you seen that? Have you used it? I haven't. We've used it with a, you know, with a school that we're already connected mm -hmm. with, but yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. It really does just, you know, cross those cultural boundaries. Mm. It's great. And it gives, it's an added motivation for the oh, children. Absolutely, mm. yeah. You can also set it up as a guess, guessing one if you don't know yeah. where the other class, or you know, oh, but the, okay. the students don't, oh, and they ask each other questions, oh, nice. like uh, 10 questions, oh, and then they have to guess yeah, which country yeah. they're in. Cool, mm. what a good idea. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I wonder who put that in there. <laughs> no idea. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Okay. I'm just going to move this one over to. Oh, yeah. It's fine. I can I can move it. I think. Usually, I I'm able to move it if I'm logged in, but I'll move it later. I'm not logged into this one at the moment. Okay, great. There's a few 
good ideas up there already. As you can see with this Padlet, I've also used it as a sort of resource bank and I've put my PowerPoint uh, from tonight up there and I've also put links to all of the different um, tools that I spoke about. So I put a link to Padlet, to Goose Chase EDU where you can sign up for your education account for free, uh, to Flipgrid, to Blogger which I didn't mention and then I also put uh, the article which I refer to, Decky and Ryan's self-determination theory. So if you wanted to do some light evening reading, you can uh, have a look at Decky and Ryan's article there as well. Okay, and I'd appreciate it. You don't have to do it now, but maybe also as a, a bit of light evening task, you could uh, maybe just add some questions or any session feedbacks on the Padlet as well. That would be great. Thank you. If okay. anyone um, joining us online has any questions, etc., please feel free to either type them into the chat screen or turn your microphone on to ask directly if you'd like to. Yep. So, yes. Uh, for the control panel of the tablet, yes. uh, can that be done by phone and tablet? Or do yes. To no, you can do it on your phone or your tablet, that's fine. You can do everything on Padlet from your phone. Um, and you can do Flipgrid. I think you, the browser has more functionality as the control panel. Um, so Flipgrid and Goose Chase would be better doing it from your browser. But uh, participants, it's really good from us. Yes. Yeah. For all of them, participants, the app is best or the phone is best. But as the mission control. Um, generally, the browser is easier and uh, it's just bigger too, so you have a bit more functionality. Yeah. Okay. Lee? With um, the Goose Chase, yes. thinking of using it on my Japan study tour, particularly yes. when they have a home state, yes. and thinking that would be a great thing to, to give them some, <coughs> you know, something to do. <laughs> is, is there a time limit? Or uh, it you can for a couple of days. Or? You it can last for a long time. Um, it can last for a few minutes, up to months. Okay. Yeah, I've used it to great effect with Japanese um, study tours. Um, one way that we used it too, because we once had a very low level Japanese study tour and we, really, we didn't realize they were as low as they were, they couldn't even go and order a coffee. There's so we, Japanese coming here. Yes, Japanese coming here. So we made a few videos at coffee shops showing them how to order coffee. Mm -hmm. Put it on Flipgrid <laughs> and then, um, oh, sorry, you were talking about Goose Chase, but we used Flipgrid. Mm -hmm. And then we had them go and practice that language in class, role play it a few times, mm -hmm. and go and record themselves buying a coffee. Um, at a coffee shop um, as, as evidence to show that they're using the language and it worked really well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of things that you can do with adults too that, are, you know, isn't that great in a university yeah. setting? Yeah. Um, they may, yeah, it's a little bit different from us, but still. Yeah, and I can think of all sorts of mm. things I could get them to do, which I like them to do anyway, but this gives a little bit more purpose yeah. to actually um, you know, put, put it up there and uh, mm -hmm. whether it's actually assessed or, yeah. or not. But, um, yeah. Yeah, that sounds yeah. great. Did anybody else have any questions? Anything else? Some feedback here from a participant. That's very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. Love to explore more um, and s to see how I can utilize this in my, in my classroom. Oh, great. So, terrific session. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Lots and lots of feedback. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and feel free to, yeah, like I said, leave it, leave it on the Padlet too if you have any questions later or you can also contact me. There are my contact details. Uh, thanks so much, Hannah. Uh, yeah, that was really, really great. And uh, even the ones that we used, I think you gave us some more ideas that we can mm -hmm. go a little bit deeper yeah. and, uh, uh, into that. And, um, and of course, the new ones, and that goose chase, I'm quite excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm great, yeah. Now, and uh, yeah, so thank you so much for. Thank you. For coming. Um, we haven't had a huge lot of people, but we've got people oh, online and people <laughs> will access it um, mm. on, the, on the video on the oh. website too. So. That's my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.